yesterday we had a refreshing celebration on krishna janmashtami and today we have gathered here to hear the words of lord krishna as contained in the bhagavad gita before i talk about swami ji and our talk uh, i would like to tell you all that vivekanand samiti is celebrating 150th birth anniversary of swami ji over a period of 4 years that is from 2011 to 15 under this we have organized vivekanand youth convention in january which included several invited talks uh, on swami ji's life and youth followed by community service activities like health camps i camp old article uh, distribution etc now we uh, would like to start this semester with a wonderful 3 day lecture series on vedanta by our very own swami ji swami sarvapriyanand ji maharaj from ramkrishna mission belur math west bengal swami ji is a learned and dynamic monk of the ramkrishna math belur he joined the ramkrishna order at ramkrishna mission vidyapeeth deoghar which is in jharkhand in 1994 Since then he has served the Ramkrishna mission in various roles including vice principal of the Deoghar Vidyapeet Higher Secondary School principal of the Shikshan Mandir Teachers Training College at Belur Math and as the first registrar of the Ramkrishna mission Vivekanand University at Belur Math At present he is an acharya at the monastic probationers training center at Belur Math You all will be surprised to know that He holds a degree in business management from the Xavier Institute and of Management Bhubaneswar and his interests lie in the varied fields of spirituality philosophy management science and education I would like to invite Swami ji on the dais as we want to offer him a small token of love from our side Bhagavad Gita as we all know is a conversation between the courageous Pandav prince Arjuna and his friend guide and mentor Krishna on a variety of philosophical issues on the battlefield of Kurukshetra the Bhagavad Gita's call for selfless action inspired many leaders of the Indian independence movement including Mahatma Gandhi himself who referred to the Gita as his spiritual dictionary In today's chaotic world it holds its a significant relevance for students for they are considered to be the future face of our nation I now invite Swami ji to uh, enlighten us with uh, his message on Bhagavad Gita for students Thank you very much Jaita It's a pleasure and a privilege for me to be here in this very beautiful institute to talk to all these bright young people um on a subject which is very close to my heart um i'll go straight into the subject there'll be three lectures the first lecture is more of a popular sort you know with uh, all the bells and whistles powerpoint and videos and so on and so forth the next two lectures will be tomorrow and the after will will go much deeper and that will be without the powerpoints and videos and stuff okay let me go straight into this subject i have selected a single uh, insight from the bhagavad gita which i want to share with you something that will be very useful for you you know in the gita there is something very interesting i have often wondered why krishna did not tell the gita to duryodhana if he had told the gita to duryodhana and convinced him not to do all those things you know evil things maybe he could have avoided the mahabharat war and uh, as a matter of fact lord krishna actually did try to uh, convince duryodhana many of you will be aware of that episode once he went to to persuade duryodhana and you know what duryodhana said when lord krishna tried to tell him that you should not do all these things and it's uh, adharma it's unrighteous it's morally wrong the way you are treating the pandavas duryodhana's reply was very interesting so duryodhana's reply was very interesting he said 
don't tell me about dharma and adharma what is right and wrong don't tell me about that because that is not my problem i know what is right and what is wrong but my problem is different he said i know what is right but my problem is i don't want feel like doing it i know what is wrong but my problem is i can't stop myself from doing it janami dharmam nachame pravritti janami adharmam nachave nivritti it's a very interesting insight into human nature he says janami dharmam i know what is right what i should do i know it you need not tell me nachame pravritti i have no interest in doing it i don't feel like doing it janami adharmam i know what is wrong what is bad what is evil nachame nivritti i can't stop myself from doing it why not why not then he says kenaapi devena hridi sthitena yatha niyojito asmi tatha karomi there is some power inside me as it is forcing me along i do that whatever it makes me do i do it i am helpless there is a strong tendency in me which makes me do certain things which i know it's wrong and what i want to do i know what it's 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 right i should follow this path but i can't i try and i fail this is my problem my problem is not right and wrong i know what is right and wrong you know sometimes young people say um yeah gyan mat do yaar i know what is right and wrong <laughs> so it's basically that was duryodhan's reply that was duryodhan's reply arjuna has the same question in bhagavad gita very interesting in the third chapter fourth chapter arjuna uh, asks krishna atha kena prayuktoyam papam charati purusha anichchan api vashneya baladiva niyojita forced by what does a person do wrong things anichchan api even if he or she does not want to do it he wants to lead his life in this way but he slips makes mistakes later on he regrets that anichchan he does not want to go on that path but baladiva niyojita he is forced somehow somehow he comes to does these wrong things and you know it automatically echoes with us we have these experiences on a larger scale or smaller scale but we all have these experiences that uh, we want to do certain things lead our life in certain way you're all students who has not got this experience you make a very ambitious routine you know 12 hours a day i'll put in 12 hours studying and then somehow the whole day has gone you find okay i'll do that tomorrow today i didn't do it and we as students we have all experienced this you want to lead your life in a particular way you can't you don't why not arjun asks this and the difference between duryodhana and arjuna lies in this precisely duryodhana did not ask a question he put it as a matter of fact i can't help it this is my life this is the way i am i can't help it what arjuna does is he puts it as a question he says what can i do about it this is what's happening to me how can i pull myself out of it so if we are in arjuna's position we would like to know how to put our lives right how can i you know i set a target how can i achieve that this is the question what is krishna's answer so this is from bhagavad gita but we'll take a detour a sort of bypass instead of going straight to krishna's answer now i will take you to the 1960s a very well known psychologist walter michel he had this experiment with little children on this very subject the experiment was like this he took little 4 year old children boys and girls and what he said was to the children that um, here is a marshmallow a kind of mithai yeah, an american sweet you want a marshmallow and a kid, kid says yes i want a marshmallow do you want two marshmallows yes i want two marshmallows so all right you can eat this marshmallow but i'm going to go out of this room for a few minutes i'll come back a little later if you wait for me if you don't eat the marshmallow i'll come back and give you one more so you can have two you can eat it now if you eat it's all right you'll get only one but if you don't eat you wait for some time not determine how much time 10 minutes 15 minutes i will come back then you can eat it and it's kept in front of the child and the, the psychologist goes out of the room and unknown to the child this was video recorded this was video recorded and uh, you will see some of those recordings 
very interesting and um, very funny also very cute I got it from YouTube and the interesting thing is some children all of them said we will wait for two marshmallows all of them said we, wa we want two and some of them did wait some of them did not they said we will wait but they could not wait and they saw that sweet in front and it is remember they're four year old so for four year old kid to wait uh, for 10 minutes also is a torture when will the when will sir come back and then I can have two and some of them succumbed to the temptation and ate the marshmallow now what the psychologist did Walter Michel what he did is he divided the two groups on pen and paper he did not tell the children anything 14 years later he went back to those children and he found amazing differences between the two groups he went and interviewed their parents their uh, classmates their teachers and he found those children who were able to control themselves they said we will wait and they did wait they on the average on the average they did better in academics in co-curricular activities in sports they were regarded as more confident self-controlled and the other group significantly lower uh, scores in you know SAT uh, scores and all that now it's amazing just a small thing little bit of self-restraint I want to do this and I do it and the other person says I want to do this but I can't do it just this difference we'll just see those videos and then I'll proceed now, this is again from YouTube Walter Michel's experiment was repeated by Philip Zimbardo those who study psychology you know he's a very well-known psychologist his book psychology and life is a standard text all over the world so this is a talk given by Zimbardo upon this experiment he gave the talk in Google and they have put, on, put up the video in, on YouTube you can see that so it's a study done at Stanford by Walter Michel with four year olds you can see here sit right up I'm going to play a game with you. See, the first part is nothing to do with the experiment because they are little children, you have to distract them. Otherwise, they'll keep thinking, what answer does sir want? So, they'll play a little game and say, now I'll give you a prize. So, the you know, child is uh, distracted. And I would like you to point to which one is the correct answer. Which one is happy most of the time? The shy one or the not shy one? Not shy one, correct. Which one has a brown nose? The shy puppet or the not shy puppet? The not shy puppet. Point it. Thank you. Thank, I'm, I'm stuck. <laughs> Which one is happy most of the time? The shy one or the not shy one? Probably that. Thank you. That's wonderful. I want to give you a prize for having done so well. Do you like marshmallows? Mm -hmm. You do. Well, here's a marshmallow for you. You can eat it now, but if you wait until I come back, you can have two of them. So you can eat this now, but I'm going to go outside for a minute. When I come back, you can have two marshmallows if you wait. Okay, I'll wait. Do you think you can wait? Okay, let's see. I'll, I'll be back in a minute. See you. Notice, notice the, the body language is wonderful. So I was looking at the door. Totally looks away the whole, the whole time. <laughs> Too hot. <laughs> you don't know it's being recorded actually. <laughs> Little distraction. Little <laughs> 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 <Hello. laughs> You waited. You waited for me. Okay, so now you know what's going to happen. You're going to get a double treat. I'm going to give you two of these beautiful, lovely marshmallows. Do you want to eat them now or want to save them for later? Okay, go ahead. A little sticky. I've had marshmallows before. Well, some children ate it, others just ate it. Right, you got it right. 
So I'm going to give you a prize. I'm going to give you a treat. And the treat is a delicious marshmallow. But if you wait, I'm, I have to go check my car. When I come back, if you wait, you can have two of them. You can have one now, or when I come back, you can have two. Okay? Okay. Ricky, have, Ricky, I'll look. Just temptation. Or just capital T. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, my dear. You ate the marshmallow. Was it delicious? Yes. Do you like marshmallows? No, this kid is wonderful. You don't like marshmallows? Look at that face. Do you like chocolate? Yeah. This boy is very funny. I ask him, do you like marshmallows? He says, no. I, I, then do you like chocolate? Yes. So luckily he has chocolate. You know, he says, okay, I'll give you two chocolates if you wait for me. And he explains it four times. Will you wait? He says, yes. But the, every time he gets up, you know, he's putting hand forward to take the chocolate. Will you wait for me until I come back? Yes, I'll wait. And four times he explains. But still, you know, before the psychologist leaves the room, he has already eaten it. <laughs> <laughs> And not only that, when the psychologist comes back, the boy says, I waited, you gave me another one now. <laughs> okay, well, I love the treat you want is a chocolate. But, 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 if you wait till I come back, you can get two. You can eat this now, I have to go check my car. And when I come back, if you wait, I'll give you two of them. Okay. So you can eat it now, but if you wait till I come back, Second you have time. time. Okay? <laughs> you think you can wait? <laughs> so I will be back in a few minutes. So you, you can either eat it now, time. but if you wait, you're going to have two of them. Okay, I'll be back soon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not out of the door. <laughs> right. I love the little skull and crossbone. Like, like a total boy. Just enjoying it, minding his own business, eating away. Good. I waited. I waited. You ate the chocolate. So, so clearly, he did not understand Zimbardo. a very important connection between if then. He didn't, he didn't make the causal link that what he heard was, you can eat one now, if you wait, you can have two. So he said, I waited, I didn't leave the room. So he ate one now, and now he wanted the other two. Uh, and so, so what, we, what we've been arguing now is, kids like that who grow up to be adults who are present-oriented, never really learn if-then relations, never really learn causal sequence, never learn about probabilities. And therefore, they're on the path to do badly in school. Because life is all probabilities, causal relations, if then. So what, does it, what difference does it make, this little thing? Before the, at four, before the age of four, no kids can wait. Because it, it does involve uh, development of the various parts of the brain. At four, about half kids wait and half don't. As you get older, more and more kids are able to delay gratification. Um, now, the interesting thing is Walter Michelle went back 14 years later, interviewed the kids, got their school records, uh, interviewed the parents, and it turned out there were incredibly enormous differences between kids who gave into the temptation and kids who didn't. <coughs> what I want to do is play you a little animation we've just made that outlines those, those changes uh, and does it in a humorous way. So he repeats a little bit of that. You may already be familiar with the famous marshmallow study conducted by my colleague, psychologist Walter Michel, in which a group of four-year-olds were given one marshmallow and told they were allowed to eat it immediately. They were told that if they could wait to eat the marshmallow after being left alone with it for a while, then they would be given an extra marshmallow to eat. Most eat the marshmallow as soon as they are left alone with it, but some other children are able to resist temptation. Those children who ate the marshmallow right away are considered to be oriented toward the present, while those who resisted temptation have an orientation toward the future. 
When the children were interviewed years later as 18-year-olds, there were amazing differences between the children who were able to delay gratification and those children who couldn't resist the immediate temptation. Scored 250 points higher on the SAT, overreacts to frustration, works well under pressure, indecisive, self-reliant and confident, prone to jealousy and envy. Okay, so that little thing, basically what he is saying is that, um, crucial to success in life is the ability to delay gratification. I want something, for that I have to make the necessary sacrifices. So maybe I have to wait a little bit before I get my reward. It is a very small thing, but this, this key insight is very important. And very interestingly, have you heard of the concept of uh, emotional intelligence? Uh, there is a new concept, not very new actually, there is a psychologist Daniel Goleman. He uh, gave this concept of emotional intelligence. In fact, more popularly the term used is EQ versus IQ. IQ is normally mostly um, analytical, numerical abilities and most of you will have very high IQ here. Why I am bringing up this subject is, he said for success in life, both in career, in academics and more so uh, when you go to a job, your career and your family life and your relationships with others, EQ is more important than IQ. That is what he is trying to say. Now, the very interesting point he makes is, is his book Emotional Intelligence. There I found very interestingly he refers to this experiment of Walter Michel and he makes it one of the core ideas of EQ. Which, which experiment? This thing about the ability to delay gratification, to control the impulse and he makes it a core point of EQ. He also says employers, people in uh, different fields, they are looking for people with actually high EQ. And why I am saying this is, um, he made a point, he gave a talk in Google also and I saw the talk and he made a point which is very relevant in, uh, in an institute like this. It is uh, an IIT, not any IIT, it is the best IIT pro uh, probably in the country and you had this so many brilliant young people with extremely high IQs. Now, the point he makes is there is no, no particular correlation between IQ and EQ. There are people with high IQ and high EQ. There are people with extremely high IQs and low EQ. There are people with extremely high EQ but not very high IQ. So, it is uh, if you plot it a scatter diagram, you will get an evenly distributed plot. Now, what he says is uh, that uh, in an institute like this, he is giving a talk to Google. So, where you select people based on IQ, you have those entrance examinations and all. So, generally people who come into this kind of institute, people have sort of cut off of IQ. You will find people on the higher range in IQ here. So, here in this institute for example, among your classmates, among your uh, teachers, you will find the difference in IQ, the spread in IQ is not much. But the spread in EQ will be quite uh, high because you have not selected for EQ. Therefore, in an environment, in an institute like this or in a job, in a, in a very good place where you are working in a research institute or in uh, um, uh, any company outside, the difference, the factor which will make a difference to you will be EQ. You follow the logic and he gave, gave this in a talk in Google that I will show you a little bit, the relevant portion of that talk. I'm Peter Collaborative on Career Sitley, who said, you know what we found? It, you alone is going to help you. So done is to make, because they are catalytic. If you had a kind of this is Daniel random Goleman. distribution. Now, if you take this pool and you map it on Google or any other company that hires that places a premium on cognitive abilities, this is the like total IIT case sample. Example. Well, what you've done is really interesting because you've, you're skimming the top. Okay, whatever, let's say this is IQ 150, whatever. It's very high. What you have now done is to make a very small difference for IQ. There's very little variation in the population at the very top and a very large difference for emotional intelligence. 
that means that whatever emotional intelligence contributes to success in an environment like this, it matters more per unit than IQ does. So there's actually a floor effect here for IQ. You wouldn't expect that IQ alone is going to help you be highly effective in this work environment. You got the point. I mean, there's no need to repeat that. Basically, what he has done is, he says, in a general population, the distribution will be like this. There are differences in IQ, less and more. And there are differences in e emotional intelligence, less and more. But when you have a group like this, like this institute, where you have a flow, because you have come through a selection process, you will find what you have done is you have skimmed the top in each, each suppose you have come from different schools and colleges and only the best in your batch, most of you are, of, uh, are the best in your batch because you, you came through a selection process. Therefore, the difference in IQ will, be, will not be much here. It will be about this much. The difference is very little. There is a floor here. But you are not tested for emotional intelligence. So there are people who have got high emotional intelligence, you've got people who have got low emotional intelligence. And therefore, more than a general population, in a population like this, this will be more important than this. In general, emotional intelligence is more important, but here it is even more so uh, in, a in a population like this. Anyway, it's the same point. It comes back to the same question. I've just shown you the importance of the ability to control oneself. Now the question of Arjuna's question was how do I control myself? Why does this happen? And how do I ha have this control? Whether it's Duryodhana or it's Arjuna or it are those four year old kids. You know, they can ask the same question. I wanted to wait for sir, but I could not wait. Because the marshmallow was in front of me and I, I wanted to wait. I had made up my mind to wait. I could not wait. Why couldn't I wait? And how can I control myself? These are, these are the questions. Now we go to Sri Krishna's answer and see what he has to say. Chapter 3. Two verses I will take up. Basically what he is saying is this. He is saying that um, there are two levels in our activities. One is at the level of our subconscious minds. He calls it Prakriti or Samskaras. So there is a level which is below our, our level of our consciousness and here we have tendencies. We have, it is, you can call it Samskaras. or Prakriti. Prakriti means, simply means nature of an individ individual. What does this consist of? It says it consists of Raga Dvesha, liking and disliking. Raga and Dvesha. Raga means attachments, likings. I want, I want. Dvesha, I dislike. What do I want? What do I dislike? It depends upon you. Your habits if you are a believer in uh, rebirth theory, so the idea is that we have accumulated a lot of tendencies throughout our lives. If you don't believe in that also, that's perfectly alright. From childhood onwards, we have developed in a particular way. So we have liking for certain food, certain environment, certain activities, books, games, so whatever, certain people. And we have dislikes, certain environment, certain food, certain kind of people, we, we have dislikes. And these differ from people, person, uh, person to person. And these are deep rooted. We are not often aware of this. It's below the level of our conscious awareness. This is one stage. The second stage is when we interact with the world, what happens is we have a, we have a reaction. It comes from here and we, we think something, we say something and we do certain things. So these are, these are the level of, these are the conscious level the level of conscious activities already expressed this is this is not expressed sub unconscious this is conscious and expressed at this level it is too late already you know i am dieting i want to control watch my weight i have this delicious pastry in front of me i like it i eat it up and then later i regret it i had thought i would not eat this but i have now eaten it so what happened was here is a raga, here is a raga and you see this attractive object X in front of you and you think I want it, you order it, give me one and eat it up and then you regret it. 
because you decided not to take this actually. This is what is happening all the time. It happened to Duryodhana, it happened to the little kids and Arjuna is asking why does it happen? It happens because of this. From our samskaras directly this is expressed. And Sri Krishna says this in third chapter in the shloka number 33. He says, Sadrisham Cheshtate Swasya Prakriti Gyanavanapi Prakritin Yanti Bhutani Nigraha Kim Karishyati. Very interesting shloka. He says, Sadrisham Cheshtate Swasya Prakriti Gyanavanapi. A person who is a jnani, who has read the Shastras, I want to lead my life in this particular way. I want to meditate, realize God, and I want to um, have daily meditation, exercise, have a fit body, I want to do my studies in this particular way. Everything is there. Gyanavan. He is aware of what he wants to do, he or she. But, Prakriti he says, Sadrisham Cheshtate Swasya, Prakriti Gyanavanapi. Prakriti is this one. Sadrisham means according to Prakriti. Even this person who is very alert, he works according to Prakriti. Prakriti Nyanti Bhutani Nigraha Kim Karishyati. Such an interesting uh, comment by Sri Krishna. People act according to their natures. What can self-control do? Nigraha Kim Karishyati. And the immediate doubt which is raised in all the commentaries is, if self-control is of no use, then... Um, what is the point of all this meditation and yoga and all spiritual practices? And they raise this doubt. Then what is the point of all this? What he is saying is, we have this prakriti and then it is expressed. At this level it is unconscious, you are not aware of it, you cannot do anything. At this level it is already expressed. You may stop it once, very, very difficult to stop. You may stop it once, next time you will fail. You fail twice, maybe succeed once and you get frustrated. It goes on like this. What is the way out? Sri Krishna says, in the 34th verse, he gives the secret. Indriyasya indriyasya arthe raga dvesha vyavasthitav, tayorna vasham agachet, tauhi asya paripanthi nau. 3.34. The secret is here. He says, between these two levels, are we clear about these two levels? One is the uh, subconscious level, samskara. This one, Prakriti and the next one is action, Karma. He calls this the uncontrollable le uh, level, it is a conscious level. It is conscious but difficult to control and this is unconscious but um, because it is unconscious you cannot control it, you are not aware of it. So this is, the, he says this is the third level and this is the first level and he says the secret is Krishna gives, this is the important point, the whole lecture, this is the mo most important point. He says the secret is, between these two levels, there is another level. There is another level and he says, this Raga Dvesha, it comes in a conscious level and this is the second level, this is controllable. What he says is, from here, the action goes here and from here to third level. From the first level, unconscious level, there is a small conscious gap when you become aware of likes and dislikes coming up, boiling up from within. Before it takes on the form of a strong desire, thoughts or you already say something, a flash of anger comes and you hurl an insult at somebody, later on you are going to regret it for be behaving like that. I need not have said that, you feel that. But you already said it. At that level, it is very difficult to control. You know, he says, I became so angry, I was burning up from the top of my head <laughs> to my toes. So, that is already at this level, third level. But he says, Krishna says, at this level, this is, this is a gap, there is a conscious gap, a window of opportunity. At that level, you can control it. At that level, you can control it. You can consciously control it. What he is saying is this. Raga Dvesha, likes and dislikes, according to our sense organs, Indriyasya Indriyasya Arthe means the earlier shloka, what it means is, each Indriya has its Vishaya, Indriya means sense organ. So, eyes have, Chakshu has Vishaya as form, these are forms. Ears, Shabda, tongue, taste, Rasa, like this the five Indriyas have their Vishaya. Indriyasya Indriyasya Arthe, Raga Dvesha Vyavasthito, each of them have fixed likes and dislikes. 
which are in your subconscious mind. There are certain forms I like, certain forms I do not like to see, uh, certain sounds which I like, certain things which I do not like to hear and so on. Certain things I like to taste, certain things I do not like to taste, all these are our conditioning and they are expressed in action, in karma. Between these two levels, he says there is a, there is a second level at which he says, Krishna says, what you can do is you can exercise conscious control. Like a traffic policeman, you know, you have a chaura here, there is a traffic policeman there. What he does is he controls traffic. Now you have a particular aim in life. So maybe it might be studies, it might be meditation, God realization, whatever. You know very well, just like Duryodhana said, I know what is right and what is wrong. How do you know what is right and wrong? According to your aim of life, there are certain things which are right and certain things which are wrong. If a little child wants two marshmallows, the right thing is not to eat the marshmallow until sir comes back. And the wrong thing to do is to eat it up because you will not get the second marshmallow. In the same way, that is a very simplistic thing, but in the same way, it works for all of us. What is right and wrong in life, we know. Now, this policeman, this conscious level, what you have to do is, whatever is coming from your subconscious, it will be in the form of think this, say this, do this. You filter it at this level. Certain things which are in accordance with your aim of life, what you want to do or what you want to be, those you allow, okay, pass and you are expressing as action. Certain things which are not in accordance with what you want in life, those you disallow, you divert them and you replace them with something good because you cannot have a vacuum. You must think something, say something and do something. So, there is a decision which you have to take. At this level, there is a decision which you have to take. It is not all that complicated. My diagrams look very complicated. At this level, you have to take a decision. And the thing about the decision is very interesting thing I will tell you. This is a power which we all have actually 24 hours a day. In the um, Kata Upanishad says, Shreyam and Preya what is good for me and what is pleasant for me. Shreya and Preya, what is good and what is pleasant. Swamiji used to talk about it often. Shreya and Preya. Preya, pleasant, what I like to do now. And Shreya, what I know is good for me now. If they are if they're same, what I like to do and is good for me, it is very easy for life is becomes very easy. But often, unfortunately, they are not same. What I would like to do, and what I actually, what is good for me, I know, these two are often different. For example, how many of you, if you could, I am not asking you whether you do it or not, but if you could, you would like to wake up at 4 o'clock and meditate and exercise and study or whatever, each day in the morning, you would like to wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning. How many of you would like to do it? If you could do it, how many of you would like to do it? So many? More than 90 percent of the audience? If I could do it, I would do it. How many of you like sleeping comfortably at 4 o'clock in the morning, especially on a cold winter morning? How many of you like it? Achha lagta hai. The same 90 percent of the audience who say that I want to get up early in the morning, it would be very nice if I could do it and I could study and I could exercise, I could uh, do meditation, whatever or take up an early morning walk and I the same person also says I like sleeping in the morning. Now what happens is here is what I want to do, here is what I like doing and there is a pull. They are pulling in opposite directions. This is the problem. And what Sri Krishna says is here you have to take a decision. And decision is suppose A and B. If I ask you to choose, please come. Make a choice in any way, give any, any sign or symbol, what is anyone. Correct. So this is what we normally do. What is your name? It's Amber. Okay, thank you. Normally, that's what we do. We, we decide something. Okay, I'll choose this one, or we do this, or something. But decision actually means you choose this and you cut this out. What it means is this one only. And this is no longer an option. Why? Because whenever we make a choice, I choose this one. So, what is good for me, I choose. The moment I choose what is good for me and I sacrifice which is pleasant for me, it is painful. It is painful to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. 
and if it is painful what happens is if this is a still a viable option the bed is there warm and cozy razai hai you feel like crawling back into bed tomorrow onwards i will follow the routine not today that's what happens and that's because this not been cut out it is still available very much available that little that little sweet marshmallow did you notice one boy was looking away like this or one girl was looking all the time why I will not look at it, it is not available to me, it is not in front of me. This is a decision, that is the correct way to do it. I will not look at it. I will not take it, whatever happens I will not take it. So decision, in fact this one comes from Caesare, you know Caesarean operation, Caesare, to cut, it means to cut. Decision means not to select, it means to cut, to cut what you are not going to do. So you remove it from your life. This will not be there any anymore. This will not be there anymore, and this is the only one available. There is no question of going to this this one anymore, and that's how you take a decision. So Sri Krishna says, you take a decision, and you select each time you put the shreya instead of the prayer. Now, what happens when you do this? It's not easy. It takes time, and you, at first, you won't be able to do it because it's a very small gap between unconscious desires and expressed. Usually it happens after that you regret it. But if you have this knowledge in the background of your mind, you keep thinking about it, very soon you will understand why it is happening in your life. And with this decision making power, if it increases uh, over the time, you begin to control it. And sometimes you will be surprised to see at that moment you are able to control it. So the traffic policeman is working. Most of you have done it. Because you are in such an institute, you have made sacrifices in your study life. Whereas your batchmates did not, you did it. So you can do it, it is possible, it is there. And one more thing I will add to this, it is in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. It says, uh, Samskara and Vritti. Evam vritti samskara chakram avattamanam. He says, this is a conscious level, vritti means thought and samskara means your conditions, impressions, subconscious mind. This is subconscious mind and Patanjali Yoga Sutra, there is a commentary by Vyasa, there he makes this point. Our thoughts are coming up constantly. Where are they coming from? Our subconscious conditionings. Where do these conditionings come from? From our thoughts. What you think that goes back as samskara. What is in samskara that bubbles up as thoughts. Now, by this method, three stages, what you are doing is, samskara you cannot change directly. You are not aware of it. Where is it? What is it? We, don't, we are not aware. But these ones we are aware of. If you consciously keep on replacing these thoughts with positive thoughts, with noble thoughts, with thoughts which are beneficial for you, positive, noble, constructive, Slowly these will go back and become samskaras. Over time you will find good thoughts bubbling up. I read the story of a Buddhist meditation exercise. The Buddhist monk you know, is sitting in meditation and his teacher told him, here is a bowl and here is a heap of black stones, here is a heap of white stones. And every time, you sit for meditation one hour or two hours and every time a negative thought anger, jealousy, uh, passion, something comes up in your mind, you take a black stone and put it in that bowl. Every time a good thought, Maitri, Karuna, peace, happiness, it comes in your mind, take a white stone and put it in the bowl. In the first few months, every day you would sit for meditation and it will be mostly after one hour of meditation, the only black thought, the black stones would be there in the bowl, one or two white stones. Over the months, he saw that balance is changing. Because he is practicing this, he is replacing at the level of conscious thought, he is replacing. So there is a traffic policeman working here and he is replacing, he is cutting off the negative thought and replacing with good thoughts. What happens is over a few months he found more and more white stones he is putting. In one hour meditation he is putting more white stones and lesser black stones and over after a period of one or two years he found uh, mo mostly white stones and no black stones or, or very few black stones. Now this is what happens, the subconscious gets purified then the job becomes easier, then you do not have to struggle so much. The thoughts which come are automatically mostly Shreya, good for your life. I remember one thing which I put here, 
<laughs> I made a table. I've told the story number of times. The first time I put it in the table. Uh, I'll tell you the sto story first. Then you'll make make sense. I was in Gangotri a few years back after taking sannyasa. I thought, you know, Ramakrishna Mission monks. We have got schools and colleges and uh, ashrams and hospitals. So day and night we are working. We do a lot of work. <laughs> Most of the people think, you know, we monks. Uh, we have it easy. Maharaj, aram se rehte hain aap. No, we we. <laughs> We, ha we do a lot of work, plenty of work. I remember when I first became a monk, a brahmachari, uh, first thing they told me after three days after I joined in Deoghar, I was a newcomer and then the senior monk told me, first I will tell you in Bengali, there are hostile they have eaten you know, free food for a long time, three days, now time to do some work. Here is a hostel with 40 boys, you go and look after them. I thought, if I had, if I had in, the, in samsara, I had gotten married, I would have got one or two children. <laughs> now, 40 children. I have to look after 40 children. <laughs> and it started like that. So, I thought, let me be, uh, after taking sannyas, let me wander like a traditional monk, you know, of the old days. I will take bhiksha, I will uh, beg for food, sleep under a tree, whatever, whatever comes, kutia. So, I went up uh, to Gangotri, 10,000 feet. The higher you go, more spiritual you are. So, uh, now that's what they think. They well, uh, stay higher as both tapasvi mahatma. Hai. <laughs> One person is to stay beyond tapovan, Gangotri, uh, Gomuk, tapovan. That's 14,000, 15,000 feet. I asked him, what was it like? He said, personally, I'll tell you, it was hell. <laughs> there is no chance of uh, spiritual practice because it just to survive it is difficult for some months at, at, at an end. Anyhow, I was in Gangotri, I used to live in a li little kutia, uh, wooden cabin. I don't know how many would like to stay there, it was very beautiful scenery, but no furniture, you have to sleep on the floor. Only thing you have got, razai, this uh, blankets, three or four on the ground you put it and three or four on top of yourself, no bedding, nothing, no electricity, no table, chair, nothing. And there is only one small window, if you open it, it is like having six air conditioners blowing at you at <laughs> once. So, you have to close that. And if you close that, it is so dark inside. And I used to open my eyes and do this. I could not make out whether my eyes were open or closed. I could not see anything. And only sometimes you can see the static electricity sparks from the clothes, you know, in, in, in uh, winter. And the static electricity is there from woolen clothes. There, a monk, I met a sadhu who was living there for many years. One day you are sitting next to me near the Ganga. Those who have gone there must have seen it is very narrow but very fast, torrential, flows very fast. And that was uh, autumn around this time, July, August. And he told me, he was told they are telling me the difference between the mind of a, of a Vishayi, worldly person and a Yogi. What is the difference? If you do this practice for a long period of time, what will be the difference? He says, he told me, I will tell you in Hindi and then translate into English. Mahatma ji, here come, see, he is Ganga ji. He says, you look at this Ganga now in rainy season. What is there? It is lot of water, fast flowing water, very turbulent and dirty because lot of landslides are there and um, soil gets deposited, it is brownish. So, he says, this water is, uh, there is lot of water and it flows very fast, it is very dangerous. If you put your foot in it, you will be swept away, you will simply be killed. There is no way of coming out of it anymore. And you cannot drink this water. You cannot give it to anybody to drink, you cannot drink it yourself also. And then he told me, in winter, the same Ganga, this is a, because uh, there is uh, mostly frozen, there is snow up to here, ice. And there is very little water. And the water is, it flows slowly. And it's crystal clear. He said, if there's a bridge, there are two bridges, in fact, over that in Gangotri. In Gango he said, if you throw up, he said, Chavani peg denge, upar se ab, you can see what denomination of the coin it is. So clear, like glass. He told me, there's so much water in a Vishayi worldly person's mind, full of many thoughts, good and bad, many, many thoughts. Similar, just like so much water is flowing. Second, he says, it is so fast. Just as the Ganga is dangerous in this autumn rainy season, a Vishayi person's mind is dangerous. Anytime anything it can happen. So many times we regret saying certain things, doing certain things. Why? 
because our mind said it and it seemed like the right thing to do at that time or we could not resist it and we did it and it can be very dangerous in IIT itself you, once in a while we see in the papers this boy or girl committed suicide and uh, I read a story not a story uh, this a very famous American novelist William Styron he's written a book um, journey into darkness he was a schizophrenic and sometimes suicidal because he's a novelist he could write very well memoirs of darkness memoirs of darkness uh, memoirs of madness sorry memoirs of madness William Styron memoirs of madness at one time he was going to commit suicide and he's written vividly he said this absolutely it felt like I have to commit suicide now there's no other way and somehow he was saved he was put under medication and all that later on he said I didn't understand why I was going to commit suicide at that time there's no reason at all this is the mind so dangerous it can sweep you into destruction addiction spoil relationships spoil your career everything that same mind and third point he said just like the Ganga is polluted now lot of mud is there our thoughts are also polluted so many kinds of thoughts this water he said isko khud nahi pee sakte kisi ko pila bhi nahi sakte jo, jo paani abhi ja hai. and he said our people's minds are like that they don't get peace and those around them also don't get peace from them opposite he said jare mein kabhi aayenge mahatma ji tab ganga ji ko dekhiyega when you come in winter i'll show you ganga then he says very little water very few thoughts are there in the mind of a yogi not that he's mindless very few thoughts we have got lot of unconnected thoughts flowing through us continuously distorted habitual thoughts those are not there in the mind of a yogi it is safe just like the ganga he says you can cross over it so little water is there it's absolutely safe you can walk across he says and in the mi yogi's mind is very safe it's not harmful to him or to anybody else and third he says pani meetha hai khud pee sakte hain dusro ko bhi pila sakte hain and he says the mind of a yogi is like that it's always at peace serene and others who come into contact with that person also get that peace i have seen some of the senior monks of the ramakrishna order i have met and outside also other sadhus good sadhus just to be with them you feel uplifted you need not go and discuss something spiritual about with them you simply be with them exchange a few words you feel uplifted or sit simply sit near them there's something in an atmosphere about them which is so much of serenity and calmness is there um, it transforms your mind at least for some time but that is due to that person not our own mm. there was a very great Swami and one, one Swami who used to stay with that Swami uh, who is a disciple of Masharada and uh, this person who told me he said I used to stay with that Swami and my mind was at a such a high plane all the time and I felt I had achieved something and that Swami he was staying in the room there was some medicine the spirit is there uh, for um, you know swabbing and all disinfection so there is a stick with co cotton wrapped around it which is kept in the spirit and that Swami took out that stick and he said look this has the smell of that disinfectant the spirit after some time if you keep it aside it will go away that's, that smell it does not belong to the stick similarly for you you are with me don't think that you have achieved something spiritually day I die after a few months you will find whatever you were earlier you are that only you have to earn it yourself anyhow the point is such people can generate can radiate spirituality could be peace up there dusra ko bhi pila sakte you get peace others also get peace this is the point um, I can go on there's more to it but we have almost run out of time I'll stop here I'll sum up I have said only one thing today and they say that you have heard of the con some concept of take home salary after all the deductions and all that thing what you take home the amount you take home home that's called your take home salary so what is your take home from today's talk the take home from today's talk is it's a central question of anybody's life I have certain goals in life I have to go towards it how do I get the discipline the control over my life to go towards it you understand what sweeps you away from that the samskaras from inside which are expressed in thought speech and action these sweep me away at the level of samskara I cannot control and I am not aware at the level of action difficult to control already expressed answer he says 
tayorna vasham agachet. Don't come under the sway of your raga dvesha. They are being expressed in thought, word and action. Before that happens, there is a window of opportunity. Be the traffic policeman there. Even if you cannot do it consciously right now, at least reflect on what happened. As you reflect, that, that conscious window comes in, in control. In fact, meditation is helpful in that. There was a neuroscientist from Nimhans, Bangalore, who showed that actually he mapped the uh, reactions of those who meditated for a long time, for several years, and he found the reactions are less from the autonomic nervous system, more from the, con uh, from the conscious centers. That means they decide what they are going to think, they decide what they are going to say, they decide what they are going to do. Most of our cases we are on autopilot, default setting. Whatever is there, it gets expressed. So that is the point I want to share with you. Whether it is Duryodhana, Arjuna or those little children or us students or Swami Sarva Priyananda or anybody, whatever our aim in life, this is a very interesting and very important thing to understand. This gap, level 2, between level 1 and level 3, there is a level 2 which we must capitalize on, we must gain control over that level. This is the talk for today. Uh, we have almost run out of time, nearly 7. If you have got questions, I will deal with it. Tomorrow and day after, I will go much deeper. No videos, no PowerPoint, because I normally I don't uh, like this, because uh, it interferes. You know, the audience is constantly looking there, sometimes at me. So, I will shut that down. I will speak to you directly. Tomorrow's topic is Purposeful Life with Vedanta. What is the aim or purpose of human life? What does Vedanta say? Who am I? We deal with that at the deepest level, a very profound uh, question. And I will show you um, actual steps. You will travel with me to the level of the body, mind and beyond to the Atman. How we can have a deep, immediate ex experience, Sakshat what they say. So, that we will do tomorrow. And beyond that on Monday, message of the Upanishads, I have selected Keno Upanishad. That is, you know, as students say, engineers, hardcore. So, <laughs> that is hardcore Vedanta. <laughs> so, that is even more serious. I um, will deal with Keno Upanishad. How to spiritualize every moment of life. I say about that topic specially. Um, it's a dangerous topic because once you go through that, if you just follow me, as, as, uh, as uh, if you just follow the scripture, what I will tell, it's irreversible. You can't change it anymore. <laughs> it's already done. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, you have stepped irreversibly into another way of thinking. You cannot come back anymore. If that sounds ominous, it's not ominous. Uh, it's uh, actually very interesting and uh, uh, very life-changing actually. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And I'll take I'll take a few questions. I'll take a few questions. Anybody? Yeah. Just tell your name. Tell your name and uh, Shutanu. Yes. For some days we control ourselves. Yes. And then in a small thing we lose and we feel like we are going back to zero. Yeah. Is self really something or what is the way out? Yeah. The question Shutanu asked is very important. We practice something, then we stop, whatever it is. So, is it last? We feel frustrated after some time or is something saved? If you look at this theory, vritti and samskara, what you practice consciously, you think certain things, say certain things and do certain things, that is added, it is never last. Arjuna in the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, he asks this question. Krishna, you are telling me to practice meditation, spiritual practices and all. But suppose I do not get jnana in this life, if I do not get spiritual realization in this life, then have I lost both this worldly life and also spiritual life? I did not get that realization, Atma, Jnana, Nirvana, Moksha, whatever. And I did not enjoy life in this world. I, I have given up certain things in this world. Have I lost both? Ubhaya uh, Vibhrashta from both sides I am lost and Krishna gives a clear answer nahi kaschid kalyana krita kaschid durgatim tata gachati kalyana krita person who walks on the path of 
spirituality, uh, spiritual welfare, he never goes to destruction. So, this is always added up. If you practice something, let it go, fine, it is there. Next time you practice, whatever you have practiced earlier comes to your aid. So, you get up at 5 o'clock and hold on to it for at least 21 days. What it does is, it becomes a habit. So, habit has its own inertia. Then it becomes easier to wake up after that uh, at, at 5 o'clock or 5.30 in the morning. If you do for 2-3 days and abandon it, it becomes equally, it remains equally difficult. It is like, if you want to jump across a ditch, you have to take one big jump. You cannot take few small jumps because you fall in the ditch if you try to do that. So, you want to make a new habit, you have to push for 21 days. 21 days is just a figure, one month. So, both ways, what you do, it is saved, but it is better to do it for, hold on to it and do it for some time. Yeah. Questions? Anybody? Yeah. What is your name? My name is Anurag. Uh, you were telling me, uh, you were telling us that uh, the things which are right or wrong or good or bad depends on what the person wants to achieve. Yeah. Uh, should there not be a uh, thing about morality in all this? Yeah. Because a person might want to achieve something bad yeah. and this good might be bad for others. Yeah. So, so they say morality, in fact in yoga, these are the five things they say, uh, ahimsa, satya, satyam and brahmacharya, asteya, aparigraha. These are the five main vows which we as monks also take. And those who want to be yogis, they should take, practice in some, to some degree they must practice all of this. Non-violence, um, not hurting others in thought, speech and action. You know, you know the, the vow in, in medicine, those who become doctors, first do no harm. This is the vow, the oath they take is first do no harm, especially important for doctors. Whatever treatment they do, they first they must see, at least we do not make things worse. Similar, uh, Ahimsa is this, whatever you can do for others or you cannot do that later on, but at least do not harm others. And so this is Ahimsa. Truth in thought, word and deed. Um, and then Brahmacharya self-control, self-control in all aspects of sense enjoyments. It is different uh, for a householder. And for a sannyasi, the, of course, the levels are different, but everybody is expected to have certain amount of self self uh, control. Asteya, non stealing, never taking what is was not due to you. That goes at all levels, uh, from not taking money, stealing money from others, or breaking copyright, uh, software piracy, or whatever. It go it it's across the board. Levels of uh, non stealing, and aparigraha not taking gifts, very interesting. If you want to practice yoga, you should be independent. Do not go out for handouts, do not take things because it is just available for free. It seems it has an effect on the mind. I am reminded of a story, a very senior monk, the one monk about whom I told you about that uh, stick in the disinfectant, Swami Premeshanandaji is a disciple, he was a disciple of Holy Mother Mahashanda. Somebody, when he was an old monk, somebody bought him a walking stick, wanted to present. And he said, no, thank you, I do not need it. He kept on insisting, Maharaj you please take it. I do not want anything from you. Please take it. I will be just happy if you just accept it. Then you do whatever you want. He said, no, no, I do not want it. So I do not want anything in return. Just take it. I will be very unhappy if you do not accept the gift. Then that Swami said, you do not want anything from me. Said, no, I do not want, really I do not want anything in return from you. He is holding the stick. He says in Bengali, Tavalo Bengedi. Let me, let me break it in front of you and you got a shock. Why did you react like that? You expect something, subconsciously at least, because I am giving a gift to you. You do not expect me to tear it up in front or break it in front of me. See, so there is an, something that a person always wants when he or she gives something to you. So not, a yogi is not supposed to take gifts. Of course, wherein you are in society, you have to be, you have to uh, 
be balanced towards it. I mean, you just can't say that, uh, uh, you know, you have a birthday party and you say, I will not take any gifts from anybody. <laughs> you do, you give something back immediately. You give something back. I remember, uh, yeah, question. Well, why, I just finish. Why I said these? The question was about morality. Uh, where is, uh, yeah. These are called Sarva Bhauma Vrata, universal vows. These are not matters of choice. To some extent, to be a decent person, you have to follow all of these at some level. At some level, you have to follow all of these. To be a yogi, you must follow them at a very high level. But to have a decent life, you must follow all of these. Why? Why these are not uh, matters of choice? You call them moral laws. But somebody asked me, students often ask, you know, moral laws. You are calling them laws, but they are not laws like gravity. Satyam. I can tell a tr uh, an untruth, I can tell a lie. How is it a law? How is it a law? I can break the law. Uh, tell the truth, it's a law. But I can tell an untruth, it's not like the law of gravity which you can't break. The answer is very beautiful. He says, you can't break these laws. You can only break yourself against these laws. The more you violate them, the more you are destroying yourself. The effect is on the psyche. It's not physical effect. It's on, the, on your character, on your psyche, on your reputation with your colleagues and your family and others. So yes, morality is a fact. It's not a choice. Okay, question. Just hold up yeah. before uh, taking up the next question. So we have a bookstore outside and there are some free books for distribution available. So anyone of you who is reading out, kindly just take it from the bookstore. Thank you. The Maharaj has come from the ashram. Now, the free books is different from <laughs> Aparigra. <laughs> you, can, you can happily accept the free good books because that is spiritual knowledge. That is spiritual knowledge. Yeah, there is one thing you can give freely and accept freely. That is spiritual knowledge. Definitely. Yeah, please do uh, avail of uh, the opportunity because Maharaj has come with a lot of difficulty from the ashram in Kanpur city. Yeah, question. Yeah. Meditation is a huge subject. Tomorrow we will go through one method of meditation. It is a very sophisticated method of meditation in Jnana Yoga. Meditation, the classic book for meditation is Yoga Sutra, Patanjali Yoga Sutra. And the best explanation and translation is Raja Yoga by Swami Vivekananda. This is one of the first books which attracted me when I came into spiritual life. Before I joined the, as a monk, and as a student, I used to read this book a lot. I'm sure it's available outside. Patanjali Yoga Sutras, it's a classic text of meditation techniques. And in fact, the vast range of meditation techniques you see in the world today, uh, especially in the Hindu traditions, not so much in the Buddhist traditions, but and there are similarities. They are all drawn from the Patanjali Yoga Sutras in some form or the other. And there, to answer your question, what is meditation? In the second sutra, meditation is defined. What is yoga? Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodhaha. Yoga is control of the uh, cessation of the modification of the mind. Vritti, this one. The thoughts, which thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas which keep on bubbling up all the time. Cessation of that is meditation. And there are techniques for that. So many techniques are there. You will ask what is the use of cessation of the vrittis? What is the purpose? What happens when all thoughts cease? Thoughts do cease when you fall asleep. And it happens in classes sometimes. <laughs> but, but if you consciously do that, you are conscious and aware, but the thoughts have ceased. Is it possible? It's very much possible and it's quite easy also. For some time it's quite easy at least. What happens? The idea is in the third sutra it is given. Second sutra, yoga chitta vritti niroda. Yoga is cessation of the thoughts. Third sutra, tada drashtu swarupe avasthanam. The drashta, the sakshi remains in its true nature at that time. At what time? When all the thoughts have subsided. Swami Vivekananda says in the commentary you will read, like a lake, 
which is absolutely without any waves and the water is very clear you can see the bottom of the lake when it's in waves and breaks out into waves or the water is muddy you can't see the bottom of the lake similarly in a mind the lake of the mind when it's absolutely calm and clear you can see who you are see means in the sense you can experience it immediate kind of immediate experience that is the purpose of meditation and for this many techniques are there if there are thoughts what happens the fourth sutra says vritti sarupya mitaratra when there are thoughts in the mind you become identified with the thoughts i am um, so and so i am happy i am sad i understand what this guy is saying i don't understand what this guy is saying i like this i don't like this i want this i don't want this these are all thoughts and you become identified with that i am this but the pure i without all this just i am that can be experienced when the mind is without thoughts that is the purpose the, and that is the what is called atma gyana or swarupa gyana tada drashtu swarupe avasthanam drashta means the sakshi the witness witness stays in its own nature this is the this is the essential idea of meditation all kinds of meditation nowadays meditation is used for relaxation you can use it yeah um, hypertension control stress management i do uh, seminars on stress management you can i use meditation also within 20 25 minutes you'll have so much level of relaxation which you have never experienced in your life wonderful but that is not the uh, original purpose of meditation in these books especially patanjali yoga sutra nowhere it is said for stress management do meditation maharshi mahesh yogi who popularized transcendental meditation in the west once he was asked this is not the purpose of meditation why are you teaching this uh, to remain uh, calm to control hypertension to uh, manage stress to remain young and good looking and healthy all these are effects uh, does this really happen he says yes it happens but these are not the purpose of meditation where is it said these are the purposes of meditation why are you teaching this so he gave a very interesting answer he said about americans he had gone to you and to the west he said i give them what they want so that they will want what i want to give them i give them what they want they want calmness they want rest they want relaxation they want stress management they want to live long and young okay it is possible i will give you all that as they practice that and get the benefits they become more and more curious about the real purpose of this yoga which i want to give them then they want what i want to give them so i like that response but then you should progress to that level should not get satisfied with just the uh, the superficial advantages which you get take one more question mm. yeah no 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 as i said brahmacharya means self control control of sen- uh, sensuous uh, of your senses of sense pleasures so this is a whole range it depends upon what you are if you are right now a student so there is a moral code of conduct for you if you are a married person so you have relations with your husband wife and it's limited to that that is what in fact what is normally considered to be decent or, or moral in society that is actually based on brahmacharya any religion it's not just yoga or hinduism in buddhism in islam and in uh, christianity everywhere you have a co- code of conduct basically what that code of conduct always does that morality always does you know it puts a limit it always is in the form of a limit thou shalt not do this you shall not exceed this limit it's always a control that is brahmacharya it applies to uh, all kinds of uh, sensual enjoyment it may be eating a rasgulla to any kind of sensual enjoyment code of conduct for a monk again is m- more strict like that yeah any more no more questions yes please is it like uh, subconscious mind yes and we would keep the art same or different there is a lot of divinity there is not same one chitta has two meanings it means the mind it also means actually the subconscious mind the storehouse 
subconscious mind is a recent term maybe in the 1920th century it has come up especially Freudian psychology uh, so chitta corresponds to subconscious mind chitta also corresponds to the mind in general I mean it's used in both senses sense mind, sense mind, huh. sensual mind yes and then chitta they are different of course in English uh, it is a living difference. for example in um, two ways I will give you in Vedanta Sara if you see mind has got four aspects chitta ahamkara uh, buddhi and manas manas huh. manas, no, is manas, uh, manas is sensual mind uh, buddhi is the intellect the vijnana ahamkara is the ego function you feel right now i i i that is ahamkara chitta is the storehouse of impressions vasanas so that's that's the fourfold division of mind in vedanta sara in patanjali yoga sutra when you come yoga chitta vritti nirodha there it is not the subconscious mind there it is the conscious mind vritti means the conscious thoughts cessation of the conscious thoughts so depending on the context chitta can have different meanings in sanskrit this is a difficulty you have to be careful what sense the word is being used the same word has got different meanings atma you say atma normally means some kind of spiritual self atma also means body in in uh, sanskrit atma just means i if you feel i am the body then atma means body i remember I will uh, conclude with this story. I remember I was in the Himalayas, I was begging for, you know, the traditional sadhus, they go for bhiksha. They can go to a village and beg for food. You don't do that. I have the right because I wear this. <laughs> you are supposed to give me bhiksha if I ask for food. But you should not beg. See, it depends on the, what you are in society. For me, it is the way of life. I mean, I can, I can ask for it. It will be dharma. But for a person who can earn and who is in society, if he or she goes and be begs, it is against dharma. So it depends on the context. Now, if I go, start earning money and then have a bank balance and start buying my food like that, then it is against dharma, my, my dharma, for example. Uh, anyway, the point is, I am I stay in an ashram. So food is cooked in an ashram and we eat, eat in the ashram. So this traditional way of going to a house and begging is really, I am not very really used to it. So the first time I went to somebody's house, so for, not the first time, one of the, the bigger beginning. This is in a place called Harshil, uh, about 20 kilometers below Gangotri. There is a, a mountain, I climbed up that, and this is a village. You know, they stay in summer, they stay in that village and in winter they go a little down. They are, uh, they do, they do the, that terrace farming kind of thing. So I went to this village, village means three or four houses. This farmer was sitting there and I went there and I was too tongue tied to, we have a, this way of, sadhus have a way of asking for bhiksha. They will say Om Namo Narayana, like that they will say. So I just stood there and the farmer understood. And he said, Mahatma ji, bhojan hua hai? And he said, nahi hua hai. Khao gaya leke jao gaya, khaen ge. He said, andar ajao. Then he took me inside, made me sit. Then he served me food. Now, as you can see, I am a very great eater. <laughs> so, he saw the quantity I was eating. I set aside the rest of the food. And he said, Mahatma ji, you are to panchi jaisa khate hain. Pahle atma, uske baad paramatma. Pahle atma, uske baad paramatma. Then it means atma is body actually. First body and then God. So, so in the village, the tongue there, atma means body. So, in Sanskrit, the word can have different meanings depending on the context. So he said, Pele Atma fit Paramatma. First body and then God. Alright, we'll close here.